Hello, good evening. Welcome to another edition of Shining Light on Shadows, a candid conversation about mental health. Our guest this week, or this show, is Indira Samani. We're going to be talking about two topics today, uh, mental health in the South Asian community and the mental health impact on caregivers and caregiving. My name is Neil Parik. My co-host is Don Helmrich. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. And if you're watching on replay, thank you for watching the show at a more convenient time. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, and my website. We're usually live on, on two Facebook uh, channels, mine and Don's, and we're also live on both of our Instagram channels. We're also live on Indira's Facebook page. So if you happen to be watching, uh, let us know where you're watching from both physically and also whose channel you're watching on so that we, we know. Um, we'll be able to put comments on the on the uh, screen, uh, but again, to do that, make sure you press play on the video. Uh, so if you're watching it in your feed, uh, press play on the video so that we can see uh, your comments there. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be uh, uh, focusing on mental health in the South Asian community and the mental health impact on caregivers, kind of a dual focus today. Don, episode five, we're doing this. It's, I know we're, we're getting momentum. We're getting people are are reaching out and watching the show, uh, getting some great comments. Um, I want to right off the bat talk again about why we're doing the show and how we got to this place, uh, and it's particularly uh, relevant uh, in April, uh, April 11th today, uh, because it's uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, and this graphic is from the Office uh, of Prevention of the Prevention of Domestic Violence from New York State. Over half of all women and one in three men have experienced sexual violence involving physical contact in their lifetime. Uh, and this is something that's very important to both of us. Um, and I'm always grateful and will forever be grateful to Candace Sanchez uh, for her show, Unspoken Conversations with Candace. Uh, I co-hosted that uh, last year's uh, uh, season focusing on male survivors of sexual abuse, people like me. Uh, and I'm only able to say that, Dawn, because of you. So thank you uh, for all of your support. Um, but we talked about mental health almost every month on that show and the impact that um, trauma has on, on people. And that really was the basis for this show. You know, I called Dawn and asked her to whether she'd be a guest. I was reaching out to people who are open about talking about mental health issues on, on social media. And I first I, I reached out to Dawn and she said. I said, so um, I'd love to co-host with you. So I just kind of uh, I've kind of wormed my way in there to um, because this topic is so incredibly important um, to me and very near and dear to my heart. And, and we're both survivors. Uh, we both uh, talk about it uh, openly. I'm not sharing anything that, that Dawn hasn't shared. She's been an advocate and a speaker for a number of years. Um, but for me, it was an outgrowth of that work. I, I spent the year talking about my own uh, experience being abused. And I actually, for a number of years, uh, and I remember saying this to Dawn at a dinner um, at a conference, I was more reluctant to talk about uh, having anxiety and depression and seeing a therapist than I was talking about being a survivor. And so this show was kind of my way of, okay, if I'm worried, if I'm scared about it, I'm just going to do it. And and the idea is to reduce the stigma around mental health. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I'll also note, Don, that five years ago, uh, this week, you were on our uh, show, Sri Sunday New York Times Read Along. It's coming up in all my, my memories. And that was like the third time you were on that show when we were talking about Denim Day and the work that we did uh, through United Way to raise awareness about that. Um, I want to bring in a couple of folks who are watching. Uh, and the a first time commenter, I don't know if she's watched the show before, but <sighs> Alyssa, it means so much that you're watching. Alyssa Tierney was a colleague at United Way Worldwide. Uh, she worked in our um, talent management 
uh, office and moved out to Colorado with her now husband who worked on our marketing team, uh, Brian Tierney, and I was there at their wedding. Uh, I also, uh, Alyssa, so thank you. Th thank you so much for watching. She says, so glad to be here live. Thank you for bringing light to this topic in this series. Uh, and she's watching on my YouTube channel in Colorado. So thank you, Alyssa. My mom is watching on Hast from Hastings on Hudson on Facebook. Thank you, mom. Uh, she is such a loyal supporter of the show and of all the shows that I do. So thank you. Apollo is a colleague from DigiMentors who's watching from Philadelphia on Facebook. Thank you. Uh, Rochelle is a, a neighbor of ours in Hastings and she's watching. Uh, she worked in um, uh, local schools as a psychologist for 30 years and she'll be a guest on our show in September. So thank you, Rochelle. Um, this, uh, the next guest, Don, I, I recognize his name. Um, can you place him or can you point to him? I can. I'm actually marrying him in less than two months. So um, that is my my fiance, Jim, um, who was a guest on the show a couple of weeks ago, um, yeah. talking talking about uh, what it's like to have anxiety and depression as an introvert. And uh, he was amazing. And he is amazing. That was an incredible uh, show. Um, Stefan uh, is another colleague of mine from DigiMentors, always here to support us both. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Stefan is in uh, Ramsey, New Jersey, um, and uh, he's going to be a guest on our show in May. Uh, so, Stefan, we're looking forward to that. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to give a special shout out to uh, my my colleague and uh, very close friend, Sri Srinivasan, uh, getting a chance to catch the show live from Florida. Uh, super grateful for this series, especially this episode, uh, since we're going to be focusing partly on uh, mental health in the South Asian community. I want to uh, give a particular shout out uh, to DigiMentors, the firm that Sri started and that I'm a vice president of, because uh, DigiMentors is has been supporting the show pro bono. Um, we do digital marketing events and digital programs, uh, strategic communications, trainings, and workshops. We also help with staffing and recruiting. Um, and Sri has been doing uh, a lot of uh, uh, workshops on AI in particular. And I'm fixing my mic. Hopefully my mic will come through a little bit close, better now. Um, but I can't thank uh, Sri and my colleagues at DigiMentors enough, not just for giving me the time and space to do the show and the resources, um, but also for amplifying it, for retweeting it, for watching, for commenting, uh, not just Sri, but a number of other uh, colleagues. So thank you to DigiMentors. Um, really it means a lot um my mom says uh, that we're doing a great social service so thank you mom uh and uh paula kiger another digimenters colleague is watching from valdosta georgia um and uh apollo wishes you uh, uh congratulations on your impending nuptials dawn uh gl we're glad you found each other and i will just say that you know more than you realize apollo it is so great that they found each other uh, Jim is uh, so perfect for Don, uh, and I'm sure Don is good for him too. But you know, I'm thinking from from my perspective, uh, Jim was exactly what Don needed when she needed it, and uh, I'm so thankful that she found true happiness with him. Um, and apparently, uh, he's also trying to communicate with you, but some kind of <laughs> cryptic, invisible message. I got it. I already know what he was trying to say. Do you know what he's trying to say? Good. Okay. I'm glad about that. Yeah. See, you're, you're, you're already in sync, which is, yep. which is good. Um, so as I said, we're, we're talking about two different topics today, uh, and, uh, they really come together in, uh, in Dira's, uh, work. She's working on a documentary, uh, about her mom who has suffered from, uh, depression for the past 20 years after losing her husband in Dira's father. And Indira is one of her caregivers. Uh, as a filmmaker, as a uh, uh, independent documentary filmmaker, Indira's kind of uh, response, you know, as as one does, oh, okay, well, let's make a movie about it. Let's make a film about it to to help raise awareness and and talk about this. So, in the blog post she wrote uh, for the show, and we'll have her talk a little bit more about this later. But uh, it's telling my mom's story and caring for her. Uh, and the quote, my mom could not immediately 
uh, lean on the South Asian community once she was diagnosed with depression and instead turned to me. Uh, and in her uh, blog post, she goes into goes on to talk about the documentary and talk about her relationship with her mom, uh, which I encourage everyone to read. You can find the link uh, to her blog post on our website in the links for the various uh, shows on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, certainly encourage you to read that. When I saw her post um, about the documentary, I think it was first on Facebook, um, when she was first, she was raising money for it, and she still is raising money to help finish the, the, the show. I had a very strong reaction. Um, I really thought about all of the aunties in in uh, my community, in the South Asian community, several who had lost their husbands years ago, um, and I and just made me think about how many people were suffering from uh, depression, uh, you know, and that we don't uh, talk about it, and that we don't know what's going on. Um, you know, and as I looked into it, I, I did a little more research and saw there were some problems with the data that's out there. And so it really made me think about how important representation was for the South Asian community. I had been working, you know, for earlier in my career, I'd worked in politics and worked to, uh, in, you know, uh, increase uh, participation in, uh, in politics for the South Asian community. And at the time, there was nobody on TV, nobody in films or sports or, or that type of thing, much less Congress. And I always thought about it uh, in that context. It would be great to have someone in Congress. Now we have several members of Congress, uh, which means a lot. But seeing in there, uh, um, do, working on this movie about her mom, and we'll learn more about her mom later and see pictures of her mom, that really struck a nerve for me. The fact that you know we were seeing... I was seeing someone who looked like people I knew in my family, in my community, and she was willing to talk about her depression uh, was a lot. Uh, Don, you wrote a blog post as well, and I'll share some links uh, in um, in the chat. Uh, you, you wrote about a blog post about your mom and your relationship with her. Can you talk a little bit about that, just a little? Yeah. So, uh, so my, my quote here is, um, my silent hell as a caregiver was always there. The anxiety, deep fear and depression were once again, nearly unbearable. I felt selfish for wanting her to not leave me. Um, this, this, uh, particular blog post is, um, Ooh, it's a really tough one for me. My mom, uh, will have passed away four years, April 23rd. Um, and I still miss her every single day, but being, um, her caregiver for the last three years, um, of her life was the biggest honor, um, the greatest joy and the most painful experience I think that, um, that I've, I've had in a very, very long time in my life. Um, I feel very, very blessed that I got to spend time with her um, and learn about her and um, and and watch her and help her through uh, a very very difficult cancer um, and through her hospice stay. Um, but it was uh, when you when you have anxiety and depression um, at the level that I do, um, trying to really hide that, mask that from her so that I could be with her um, and, and love her and care for her uh, was very, very, very difficult for me. I, um, I, I spent a lot of very uh, lonely evenings um, kind of uh, trying to get through, trying to get through that. Um, and and I'm, I'm still not there. Uh, it's been f almost four years and I, I miss her um, every, every single, every single day. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Don. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, and, uh, I want to just point out that, uh, Jim's, um, comment that we couldn't see in, uh, StreamYard were all hearts. Uh, it just didn't come through, but they're hearts coming through. And I think that, um, particularly sharing about your mom, I know that you've, I've seen your post about your mom. I know how close you you were and how how uh, hard it was, and that's why when when I talked to Indira and I saw this this um, topic, I thought this would be a great show for us to do because it it really speaks to two very important issues that we both uh, uh, care about. 
Uh, with that, uh, I want to bring on our guest, uh, Indira Somani, to talk a little bit about her, her mom, the documentary, her role as a caregiver, and so much more. Uh, Indira, welcome to the show. Hi, Neil. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, I really um, am. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be a guest today. And uh, Don, I just want to. Uh, oh, there's a bit of an echo. Uh, yeah, I, Don, I just want to say um, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, there is no formula to grieving. It's uh, it's different for everybody, and don't feel like, um, oh, I should be able to handle this by now. It's uh, I my dad passed in 2002, and um, I felt like it was at least six years before I could really kind of. Um, I don't know if he came up in conversation, I could talk without, you know, shedding a tear. Uh, and it was definitely, um, we would have these pujas on the, on the anniversary of his death, um, every year. And it wasn't until the 10th anniversary of his death at that puja that I didn't break down in tears and I really just held it together. So, um, I, uh, Anyway, on that note, um, we are here to talk about our moms. We're here to talk about our roles as caregivers, and we're here to talk about uh, the South Asian community. Um, so to be clear, Neil, um, I didn't just, I, I don't know, I don't think this is exactly what you said, but I didn't just like wake up and say, oh, let's make a film about this, you know? <laughs> you know, um, My mom has been, uh, you know, since my dad passed, she's really struggled with um, depression. And um, she is a retired award-winning social worker, which is sort of the irony in all this, is um, she worked mainly with dialysis and kidney transplant patients as a medical social worker. And, uh, but, you know, there she also had her rounds of being on call working with uh, rape victims and domestic violence and child abuse and, you know, sort of all of these uh, types of cases. And um, so my, uh, I guess I reached out to her and said, asked her, you know, what do you think about making a film about sort of what you're going through? Um, because, and she was completely on board. She wants to get the message out that depression is real and um, it does exist in the South Asian community. Uh, and, you know, another thing that I want to say is, so I hope uh, if anybody from Springfield is tuning in because they're uh, the Springfield community, my hometown have been huge supporters of the film and um, they the thing is, you know, I, I say in that blog post that she could not immediately lean on the South Asian community. And I, I still stand by that. I mean, the community is incredibly supportive now, and perhaps they've been incredibly supportive the last 10 years. But in the early, perhaps within the first two years, there were honestly only one or two aunties who really were there, I felt who were really there for her and sort of understood her struggle. And that has to do with um, one of her close friends whose own mom suffered from depression in India. So she really understood what my mom was experiencing. And then of course, another friend of hers who uh, was a physician who definitely was sort of giving me and my sister guidance on making sure mom gets the medical help that she needs. Uh, maybe you can, you know, give me some. Okay, well, we'll start. I was going to start with. Yeah. The, the, we had uh, two pictures. Sure. Uh, yeah. One of the things that. Okay, so what you see here is really my mom does not want to get get out of bed. So what happens when people are depressed? They don't want to get out of bed. They just don't want to get out, get up, and start their day. And so I'm wearing this sort of maroon sweatshirt, and what. This scene is really sort of a tug of war 
And I'm not even sure I'm going to even show the whole scene in the film because it's it, it can be very graphic. I mean, she is holding onto that blanket and she does not want me to take that blanket off. And I am trying to follow her doctor's orders and that it's that she has to get up and she has to maintain her circadian rhythm and she has to have breakfast and she has to take her medication. And it can be a huge battle to try and get her out of bed and so there's this scene in the film where, you know, she just doesn't want to get up and I am, you know, I'm pulling this blanket off and she's pulling it back on. And um, it's, uh, so that's, that's one of the key things that happens when somebody's depressed. They don't want to get out of bed. They just want to stay in bed all day. And, um, and so this also uh, is part of my role being a caregiver. So. You know, I was really embedded with her during the pandemic, working remotely, and uh, and we had a cinematographer embedded with us as well. And you know, she really uh, wasn't uh, taking care of herself. You know, there's a scene where I'm sort of cutting her nails, I'm getting her clothes ready so she can start her day. Um, there's a scene where, you know, she we we got a life alert device, which she ended up canceling the service, but because she never wore the device around her neck. But there's a scene where, you know, the life alert device is found in the dryer. You know, first it was in the washing machine, then it was in the dryer. And so, you know, something triggered it where the intercom system went off and, uh, you know, they're asking her, are you wearing your device? And we can't find it anywhere. And then of course, you know, we find it in the washing machine. And that happens with a lot of sort of senior citizens. They forget where they keep it. It's in their clothes. It's in their pockets. Um, a lot of times what happens in um, South Asian culture is uh, people think that you can resort to prayer to uh, sort of deal with your mental health issues. But as you know, um, prayer cannot solve uh, your struggles with mental illness. Uh, my mother has been diagnosed with a chemical imbalance in her brain, and uh, her her da and with her with her medication, she can lead a very very productive life. But the thing about mental health is, you can go through down cycles every three to four years, and I think that's when my sister and I were more actively, uh, really became very active as caregivers. Um, she was 62 when my dad passed. And, uh, you know, this is the generation that came here in the 60s. You know, my mother came to this country in 1964. Sure. And my father came in 1961. And my mother came um, on a fellowship to pursue her master's in social work. It was her father in Calcutta, India, who encouraged her to go overseas and pursue social work. And uh, so she did not come uh, as part of, you know, a spouse uh, married to somebody uh, in an arranged marriage. She actually met my dad in the cafeteria at the University of Pittsburgh. And, you know, this is a fiercely independent person, fiercely independent. And so she, uh, she does not want to give up that independence at all. And that's you know, that's another struggle that we find sort of as caregivers. This is a picture of the two of us um, on Mother's Day in actually, I think it was in 2012. And um, I think it was taken in New Jersey. We were actually visiting my aunt there. And uh, so this is obviously when she's doing really well. I mean, this is the thing about, um, I mean, I don't want to necessarily seem like I'm promoting you know, Western medicine is the answer because I, I don't necessarily think Western medicine is always the answer. I really do believe in meditation and yoga and uh, holistic medicine. But in my mother's case, Western medicine was definitely the answer. I mean, when she is in a, what, her medication can be, can allow her to lead a very productive life. Um, you know, this is a woman who was with Toastmasters for 36 years and even earned a bronze medal. She loves public speaking. She was part of a women's investments club. All the women were in their 70s and 
there were maybe seven or eight of them and they were, you know, it's a small group, but research the stock market, stock market were very savvy investors um, on the board of the Illinois Innocence Project, on the board of the Illinois uh, World Affairs Council, um, a member of the Asian Indian Women's Organization, on the board of the Hindu Temple in Springfield. I mean, once she retired at 65, she was incredibly active. Uh, and so you wouldn't know that she was suffering from depression uh, because she would take her medication and you know still continue to lead the active life. It's just that depression, it can, like I said, you can fall into what I call down cycles when you're struggling with depression. And uh, it's when she was in these down cycles, even if she's taking her meds, it's, you know, medicine is not a hundred, it's not a hundred percent. And, uh, and it's in these down cycles when she would really um, struggle to get out of bed. Sure. I want to uh, bring in a few comments. Uh, my mom uh, is just uh, thanking you for uh, the work you're doing uh, in the South Asian community, getting this story out is so important. Thank I you. will, and, and we talked about this earlier, but at some point, mom, uh, we're going to try and connect you with the uh, Indira's mom because you both did similar work as social workers in hospitals, working in dialysis and working with patients and working on discharge. Uh, Indira, Indira and I were very uh, surprised when we realized that connection. I know. I, we need to have a show with our moms. Well, I really we'll feel do. That you know, we need we'll to have a show that with our moms. <laughs> but I want to bring in this comment from uh, Reba Mukherjee, who, uh, oh, I if know. She's, uh, you know her, uh, yes, she's, I... she's saying, hi, my mom is a retired psychiatrist on Lexapro. Uh, Lexapro is a uh, uh, an SSRI, right? A lower dose Um uh, anxiety medication. I find that elderly Indian ladies benefit from being in a community of supportive friends. When they are older and develop medical problems, uh, they can become isolated and hence more depressed. I cannot wait to see this documentary. Thank you, Reba. Yes, I've known Reba for many, many years. She's uh, been incredibly supportive uh, to me. And, um, you know, that's, I mean, you know, that's the case in point right there. Her mother is a retired psychiatrist and she's taking some medication and um, and she hit it on the nail. Like one thing that I've learned is that um, it's so important to have friends and not to feel lonely and not to be isolated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this comment from uh, Rochelle is actually a good uh, transition. Um, sharing these photos of your mom's mental health journey adds so much impact to your words. Thank you for sharing your family story. So many families have members struggling with depression in silence. Don, I want to bring you into the conversation um, and and really uh, because you have some pictures of your mom as well that uh, I want to put on the screen and to talk a little bit more about your your role as caregiver and and that you know that impact uh, the mental health impact on caregivers uh, because that's something that you know I know from working. I worked with SEIU, a, a home care workers union, for several years in Washington State, and most of them were family caregivers, uh, and, and that's a lot. It's it's a it's a huge impact on people when you're when you're in that role. Uh, here's one picture of your mom. Um, tell us tell us what we're looking at. Yeah, so um, so this is my mom um, after she had uh, broken her arm. Um, she had cancer and uh, they could not fix her arm. Um, my, my mom actually uh, lived almost two years with a broken arm. Um, she was in a rehabilitation center here. And, uh, you know, it's so funny because my, my mom, she wasn't the best at pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and like, this is one of the best smiling pictures mm -hmm. that I have of her. Mm -hmm. And she's like in the like worst place. Like she's mm -hmm. just in this awful state. And, mm -hmm. but yet she, you know, she always tried her hardest to, um, to have a positive attitude and to come, you know, with, with a smile on her face. And, uh, and that's kind of why I love this picture, but like, she was really in a horribly, horribly bad place, um, when this picture was taken. And, uh, and, and you're right, Neil, like for, for caregivers, I mean, I, and I'm sure that, that you can attest to this and Dara that, um, we, I had to take some FMLA, 
Um, I had to family medical leave, mm -hmm. yeah, family medical leave. Um, I was going to her, um, hospital and her bedside and, and her rehab center every day after work, not getting home until late at night. Um, my children, I, you know, my children were not, um, completely grown adults yet. They were in their teens. Um, and they, they were so generous um, to give up t time, my time with them in order for me to be with my mom and also to come and see my mom as often as they could. Um, my daughter, in fact, um, chose not to go to school out of state. She had the opportunity to go out of state. She chose to go to a local school um, because my mother was so sick that she wanted to make sure that she was here Um here for her. So, so that's a, that's a very, um, a special picture. This picture is so one of my favorite pictures of her. Um, there's nothing better than when you can get your 80 year old mother to do duck lips with you. I will tell you that. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, but she was just, uh, this, this, you know, this was when, uh, she was at a point where she, uh, was in a wheelchair. She had a broken arm. She could not get up, um, and, uh, very easily on her own. She had a, a reclining chair that lifted her to her feet so that she could get into a wheelchair to wheel herself um, to the bathroom. She had caregivers coming in morning, afternoon, and, and night to dress her and feed her. Um, but she still was willing to give me a give me a duck face here. So, um, but it is it is very taxing on um, on the caregiver. Um, and I learned that that's not a selfish thing to say, um, that it is absolutely okay for me to have struggled through that and that it it is it is not selfish. While it felt very selfish at the time to be like, I don't want to go there today. Like, I don't want to. I don't want to see her like that. Um, I don't want to watch her suffer. Um, but to still go and to still... Um, know that that was my work at that time um, was something that, you know, I, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to do that with her. Absolutely, Don. I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful that you, you shared uh, your journey because you're absolutely right. There's been a lot written about how the caregiver needs to take care of themselves. And um, I really you know, you find yourself doing everything, you know, making the meals, just doing everything. And you don't, you know, you don't get a moment of rest until you go to bed and then you start the day all over again. And it's so important to, um, I really tried to do some yoga when I was sort of uh, embedded with my mom um, uh, and working remotely during the pandemic. I really tried to do some meditation. I tried all kinds of things to take care of myself. It was hard. I didn't really have this concentration that I wish I had. One of the things that uh, that I wanted to to talk about, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, when you know I first uh, saw your post in there, and I thought about you know my experience and my my world, my community. Um, the thing that that hit me the most is really when I started looking at looking for data on on the experience of uh, you know, South Asians and mental health. Um, I did find you know one really good credible stat. Uh, one in five South Asians report experiencing a mood or anxiety disorder in their lifetime. It was shared by the South Asian Public Health Association uh, mm -hmm. and there was a really good study that that that, that, that came from. Um, for context, one in five US adults experience mental illness from from NAMI. Uh, National Alliance for Mental Illness. So it was interesting to see that, you know, very similar number. But after that, um, I was very frustrated. Uh, and it, it took me back to my days when I was working as uh, in, in policy in Washington, D.C. Um, there's so, so little data that is broken out by ethnic group. Mm -hmm. right? A mm -hmm. lot of it is by Asian, you know, kind of the top line, mm -hmm. white, Black, Hispanic, Asian, uh, etc., um, and you can't really not only can you not have the 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 data disaggregated, 
but then you also have uh, you know people not understanding the data. Even like I could, I was reading through various websites looking for stats, and and there were so many misrepresentations of the South Asian experience where people would uh, right. quote a data point, and it was actually referring to Southeast Asians instead right. of South Asians. Right. right. It's um, very frustrating, Neil. Yeah, I I I think I even shared some information with you that. Uh, well, the pandemic, of course, shed light on yeah. uh, the lack of caregivers in the U.S. and caregiving is a sustainable pr profession. Uh, the CDC reports that the number of people 65 years and older is expected to double between 2000 and 2030. And uh, the, well, you just shared the American Psychiatric Association also says one in five U.S. adults experience mental yeah. illness yeah. and um and uh, the decline in mental health um, is also uh, reported by the, um, well, it says older people who face physical challenges such as reduced mobility, chronic pain, frailty, and other health problems contributes to their decline in mental health according to the World Health Organization. And I also found something um, that had to do, South Asian immigrants increasingly experience high rates of mental disorders uh, which often go unaddressed, according to the Journal of Immigrant and Minority Health. So um, yeah. it is, uh, I will say that when I launched my Kickstarter campaign, which was my fundraising campaign, which was, you know, um, it was it, we launched it December 19th, um, just before the holidays, but it went till this February 2nd. I was inundated with emails and from people and text messages from people saying, I'm so glad you're making this film. Um, did I tell you about my dad who suffered from depression when my mom had Parkinson's? Or, you know, people would be sharing their stories and how real it is. And, um, but I think, you know, it, we also have to think about this particular generation. Uh, and this is something that, you know, I've really uncovered with my own dissertation research, and that is, you know, they when they came to this country, there was no internet, there was no WhatsApp, there's no social media, none of this. And so they're relying on letters to stay connected to their extended family in the United in, in India. And you know, back then it takes a month for a letter to get to India and maybe a month for another letter uh, to get back to the United States. And that's only if people, you know, respond right away or if a letter doesn't get lost in the mail, you know, all of these things. I mean, just think about how we operate as humans. We are so, um, we're constantly in touch with our friends, with our family through uh, various electronic platforms. And the amount of mental strength it took for, I find, this particular generation to leave their family and try and build their lives here. And it wasn't easy to go back to India and see people. I mean, my dad was in this country for five years before he returned to India to see his family or could afford to return to India. And um, my mom didn't see her family for at least three years. And it was only until after she married my dad in Pittsburgh. So we're talking about, uh, it's an incredibly, um, the amount of mental strength that it took then. And then the other thing I think about is, you know, they're in a space, at least the generation I'm thinking of, they're in a very different socioeconomic space now. I mean, they built their lives. Uh, they raised their kids to be, you know, we're of the same generation of, you know, we're, 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 we're established in our professions and so forth. And um, they've, they've had to really sort of, uh, be open to getting sort of the help that they need sure. uh, for for mental health. Sure, it was one of the uh, uh, data points, and I'm I'm kind of bringing it up on my um, from my blog post. Uh, what was you know particularly uh, frustrating is when you know they would include in the study itself, um, although um, utilization rates among South Asians in the U.S. are lacking. Several sources indicate that Asian Americans, especially those that are foreign born, underutilize mental health uh, to a greater extent than general than the general U.S. population. So there is data out there. It's just a question of I'm hoping that your your film, 
this conversation, uh, the other or advocacy organizations that are out there can push for better research, better data, a better understanding, not just of, of our generation, Indira, but our parents' generation as, as well. Um, so we can you know, get the resources and, and help they need. Um, I want to uh, bring in um, a comment, and I'm not sure of the organization, but I'm going to put it on anyway. Bridge uh, Milani is watch, walking, watching on YouTube. Oh, uh, yeah. And there, do you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Malani. Dr. Uh, Dr. Malani, old family friend. Um, he uh, uh, has known my parents uh, for many, many years. Um, I think my parents went to his son's wedding, you know, way back in the day. Yeah, this, um, uh, they're, they're actually a husband-wife couple, and they're both physicians. Um, uh, Mrs. Milani, also a physician, is a esteemed uh, OBGYN. Um, I don't know if they're retired. I think I have to look up this organization, San Giovanni. Yeah. Uh, headed, uh, you're uh, looking at it right now? I tried looking up. I didn't find a... Uh... Uh, um, well, uncle, uh, maybe you can put the link in, uh, yeah. so we can try and look at, uh, look it up. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to say, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, uh, you know, it is, it is so important, as you said, for people to want to, uh, be open to getting help. And, and not everybody is necessarily open to that. Oh, here's what I wanted to say. I remember during the campaign, somebody said to me, wouldn't it be great? And she was sharing her mom's story. And she said, wouldn't it be great if our moms had a Bengali therapist? You know, and I just thought, oh my goodness, she hit it on the nail. She mm -hmm. absolutely hit it on the nail. I know my mother's face lights up. She's Bengali when she hears the Bengali language. Sure. And believe it or not, um, she's in Denver right now. And I did a lot of research and I found a Bengali therapist. But guess what? This Bengali therapist uh, does not take Medicare. OK, and I know my mom doesn't want to pay out of pocket. I mean, all of this stuff is expensive. Sure. And, you know, this therapist would have been absolutely perfect for her. Um, I mean, I really... Uh, I just, you know, I think language is also a barrier to reaching older Americans in, in ethnic communities. And uh, we do need a Spanish speaking therapist, uh, Gujarati speaking therapist, Bengali speaking therapist. I mean, we need people who are willing to talk to older Americans in their native language. I think that would also really make a difference. Um, do you see more comments? Absolutely. Yeah. A few more comments coming in. Apollo uh, says, what's good to see here is the tackling of stigma, especially for the elderly. Hopefully with more storytelling, the stigma can be challenged in all communities. Um, and uh, my mom uh, says she agrees with the data uh, because many Indians hide when they seek psychiatric treatment. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's even, it's a bigger issue than that. It's a question of, um, you know, even after some of the data I saw, even after people are diagnosed with a mental illness, mm -hmm. they don't get treatment. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, the number of people who are diagnosed is underreported because people aren't even going right. to get initial uh, care and, and acknowledge mm -hmm. the symptoms they have, much less when they mm -hmm. do get diagnosed, they're not getting the care they need. Now, one thing I will, will point out, one of the issues, um, you know, in terms of, uh, looking for care and finding, uh, you know, uh, professionals that you can connect with and, and, you know, find someone who maybe speaks your language or is at least your same ethnicity. I, I do want to say though, that that's not a guarantee of a good relationship between a, a, uh, absolutely. A, a, You're a absolutely therapist, right? right. You right. have to feel really comfortable with your doctor. Yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, um, so as you know, I grew up in Springfield, Illinois, and um, uh, and my mom's, both of the doctors she saw there happened to be Indian women. Now, the thing is, her last doctor um, was a geriatric, a psychiatrist who specialized in geriatric psychiatry and a South Indian woman. I mean, my mother said to me, I want an Indian female doctor who specializes in geriatric psychiatry. And I'm thinking, how am I going to find this in Springfield, Illinois? But of course, 
you know, uh, she was there and they had a very good relationship. And her doctor before that, who was treating my mom for at least 16 years, um, also an Indian woman. Uh, um, I mean, both of them were, I believe, you know, even younger than me, but my mom felt very comfortable with them. I was not 100% sure if they were necessarily the right doctor for my mom, but it didn't really matter what I thought because my mom was very comfortable. Um, I see. Um, so, so Dawn, yeah. do you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in um, because as a researcher and mm -hmm. somebody who works at United Way and um, we do a lot of things around mental health at, at my United Way, um, I just wanted to make the comment that um, so often we hear from people in our community that they they want a therapist that looks like them that right. they want a therapist that speaks their language. Um, right. So, I, you know, I think it, it, it crosses um, over every culture. Sure. Um, right. You know, we, we have a, a high Hmong population in Milwaukee and a, right. and a, and a high African-American population. And um, that is, there are not enough therapists um, for, uh, for people in different cultures that look like them. Well, I would what I would say just to be uh, specific about it, um, that the um, you know when I was in uh, Seattle, uh, and I talked about this uh, in our last episode when I was in a, in a particular crisis, and I reached out for help, I got paired with a uh, Indian uh, American, a South Asian therapist at the University University of Washington, um, but who was you know more of an uh, I, I think he was a, a little bit older. He was, uh, you know, he wasn't born here. He was an immigrant uh, generation, and we didn't connect at all. Sure. I actually did much better, and I'm still hoping that I'll be able to get him on the show. Uh, an older uh, black man, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Michael Kane, who uh, his specialty was PTSD among African Americans, but he and I hit it off, and we uh, continue. We remain friends and are in touch. So it's, it's. I think there's. It'd be interesting generational you know, the generational difference in terms of when you're looking at uh, therapists or looking at providers, who you connect with, right? I'll, I'll relate much more to someone who was born and raised here right. than, than not. I, I was just going to, the other part of my comment that I wanted to make was that the other piece of this is um, for, for, for my particular, I saw a lot of therapists um, and it wasn't until I found a therapist that specialized in sexual violence issues that I really connected because that is a, that's a, that's a, right. Those types of things um, are also very, it didn't matter to me who that person was as long as they understood the types of issues that come along with that kind of trauma. So I think that there's, there's that piece too. It doesn't always have to be that way. Um, but it really is about connecting with the right person that um, that has experience in what your whatever your level of trauma is as well. Absolutely, Don. I couldn't agree with you more. It would not make sense um, uh, to see anybody else. In fact, I mean, and it's also been challenging, you know, trying to find doctors who have the specialty. Uh, that you need uh, to treat your mom or to treat yourself, you know. Um, but I, I, I agree with you, Neil. It's about who you connect with, and and I could see I could see that uh, really connecting with somebody who's born and brought up here. Sure. So I want to bring it back. We we have a little bit more we want to talk about uh, around caregivers, uh, and we want to show some resources on the screen. But I just want to remind folks that. Uh, we're talking about uh, Indira's uh, uh, documentary she's making. The working title right now is Mom and Me, uh, but that might evolve uh, over time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my grant applications, um, it is uh, called I Love You More Than My Life uh, sure. because, um, I don't know, I've been told that uh, Mom and Me was good for the Kickstarter campaign, but not necessarily what the film should be called. And it my mom, evolve. my it may evolve. My mom ends every phone call with "I love you more than my life," and um, yeah, you know, making a film is 
is a lot. Uh, this has been a major undertaking. We've been filming for three plus years. Um, we just, uh, you know, this is me finally getting mom out of bed. These are some old, um, uh, thank you, Reba. Thank, Look, you Reba so much. thank you so much for watching, Reba. Before you go, I just want to point out that part of this process, there's probably still another year left uh, of, for Indira and her team to do the editing and post-production. Right. Uh, there might be some additional shooting that needs to take place. Right. Uh, but if you're interested, you can help her finish the job. Uh, she's raising money uh, through a partner. Uh, the link is Mom and Me. Uh, dot alira fundraising dot com. I'll share it in uh, Facebook as well. Um, but anything you can do to help, uh, you know, get this project to uh, to the end would be much appreciated. Uh, it is certainly something we want to see out there in the world, and uh, it's not easy. Uh, Thank you. Kind of Thank you, Neil. I really appreciate it. I mean, I will say something that I'm really excited about is the fact that. Um, so although my dad was uh, in science, in medicine, he had a hobby of shooting on super eight millimeter film. So I had all of that uh, archive, all of that archival footage digitized to 4K. And what I'm trying to do is create some sort of parallel construction with the film to show the mom who is in this, you know, in that, in that photo of me as a baby, you know, uh, as someone who, was incredibly nurturing and a care and cared for me and now how the roles have reversed and I am caring for her and my sister is caring for her and so forth. Um, this is a picture of, a, you know, this is my mom really, this is when she's doing well and she loves gardening. And, uh, and I just want to point out if people go to the fundraising page, this is what it'll look like. This is the fundraise, the, the fundraising page, not the other one. But um, I shared both links in Facebook. But if you're if you're interested, please uh, please check this out. Um, I do want to um, close or or start to close a little bit. Um, but there is a uh, another uh, data point and an organization that I want to point out to people uh, around caregiving because uh, this is so it's intertwined the South Asian uh, discussion, the caregiving. Um, this this uh, data point. Uh, the mental and emotional effects of caregiving, 40 to 70% of family caregivers have clinically significant symptoms of depression. Um, 40 to 70%, which is just uh, incredible. Uh, about a quarter to a half of these caregivers meet the or diagnostic criteria for major depression. Um, and this is from the Family Caregiver Alliance. You can find more information about them on their website, caregiver.org. Mm -hmm. uh, caregiver.org. Um, we actually close uh, each show uh, in there by sharing some uh, data and some uh, information from uh, other uh, organizations. Um, mm -hmm. So NAMI, uh, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, they have a helpline, 1-800-950-6264. Uh, you can also go to their website, nami.org, or text them. But again, they're highlighting the one in five number, one in five adults suffer or have suffered from mental illness at some point in time. Um, we also uh, give uh, some attention to mental health in America. Uh, Dawn, this is a, a, a really, I think a really interesting infographic because it kind of broadens that picture, right? 18% um, of adults have a mental health condition, over 43 million Americans. Um, and we talked about this a little bit in our last show, 9.6 million experience suicidal ideation. Uh, and this is from Mental Health uh, America. Uh, so we want to make sure people kind of understand that context as well. Um, and finally, we also uh, want to make sure that we get the number up there, um, chat at 988lifeline.org or mhnational, uh, mhanational.org is their website. Uh, and then we actually always show the uh, data point from Rain, going back to the beginning. You know, Don and I, we've shared that we're both survivors. Rain is a rape, abuse, and incest national network. Every 68 seconds, American an American is sexually assaulted, particularly during Sexual Assault Awareness Month. We want to make sure that uh, we're raising awareness about that and 
letting people know that um, they can uh, get help through their website and through their um, through their uh, hotline. Um, I just put a couple of links yep. there in our chat. Yep. I don't know if you okay, great. I, I have them ready to show, actually. Um, okay. So uh, the South Asian, another uh, organization that we are um, uh, want to make sure we show is the uh, South Asian uh, Mental Health Initiative uh, and Network. Uh, so we'll put that on the screen as well. And we have the banner for them, their uh, website, uh, SAM. HIN.org. Absolutely. I mean, this, this, is, this is an incredible organization. And um, I have found uh, what I did was, is I reached out to them for funding. And um, when this film is done, we're going to be working together on outreach. Actually, I've had other organizations uh, reach out to me um, and about uh, being part of the impact campaign because um, it's not just obviously about mental health and caregiving, but, you know, it's obviously it's about the relationship I have with my mom. But, you know, this is an organization I didn't even know I existed. And um, the person who uh, launched it, uh, Dr. McKeja, he's he's really uh, passionate about these issues and understands um, the struggles of uh, mental health in the South Asian community. And there's one other organization, the South Asian Public Health Association, which we mentioned oh, right. earlier. Uh, and you can find uh, their uh, website, uh, sapha.org, uh, safa.org, uh, for the South Asian Public Health Association. They're the ones I found had the most credible information online. Um, so thank you uh, uh, for letting us share that with you. Uh, I do want to bring in a few more comments before we uh, close. Um, we have uh, uh, Stefan, uh, such an incredible undertaking, will support by sharing on all platforms. And that's certainly, you can share this on social media and let people know about the project that's out there. So thank you, Stefan. Um, and uh, Alyssa, who started off the show, I, the comment that I shared, uh, this has been incredibly powerful. Thank you, Indira, Neil, and Dawn for sharing your experiences. In there, I really look forward to watching your upcoming you. film. Um, if folks joined us late, I want to make sure that you know that you'll be able to watch the show from the beginning um, on all the links that you're watching now on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on my website. We will be putting it up on Instagram as well. It'll take a little bit longer to put the uh, live show up. Uh, but as soon as we're done, Give it a few minutes and you'll be able to watch it from uh, the beginning. Uh, our good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Chitachi, uh, joined us late uh, saying good evening. Uh, so in particular, if you happen to join late, uh, you'll be able to still watch the show uh, from the, the very beginning. Um, we we have, uh, as, as we've mentioned, the show runs the second and fourth Thursdays of the month, twice a month. Uh, Don and I kind of came up with that cadence. We, it was comfortable for us. Weekly is a lot. I do the show uh, with three every Sunday. And um, so our next show is actually going to be um, uh, someone that Don knows. Uh, it's uh, the fourth Thursday. Uh, Kat Claus, uh, is, Kat Claw rather, is going to be our guest. Don, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Kat? Yes. Um, so Kat is, uh, so this, this month, as Neil said, is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. April 24th is Denim Day, which is a day to support survivors of sexual assault by wearing jeans. Um, and she is going to be on talking about um, mental health as it relates to her advocacy work. She is a survivor of sexual assault, um, and she does a tremendous amount of of uh, legislative advocacy work. Um, and she's going to talk about the healing process of doing that, but also the, the mental health toll that that takes. And uh, will be that'll be two weeks from today, April 25th, Thursday, April 25th. Uh, it's something that uh, Don and I can both relate to. Um, you know, Don has uh, been an advocate much longer than I have and, and a public speaker on this issue. I know that last year with the show I did with Candace, it took a toll uh, to talk about this on a, on a regular basis. So 
I'm looking forward to that conversation with Kat uh, in two weeks. Indira, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so it. much. Thank yes, you. Thank you so much. Thank you we both. We really appreciate you being on. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about mental health and uh, the South Asian community and caregiving in the South Asian community. And uh, as you can see, you can follow Indira on social media, uh, iSamani on Twitter, indira.samani.1 on Instagram. And you can also learn more on her website, indirasomani.com. And my uh, Facebook page, I think, is the same as my Instagram. So, <laughs> and, and you can find her on Facebook as well. Thank you again. Uh, thank thank you. you for all of your support, uh, for people watching. And um, we will see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.